Southwest captain who landed that plane was Tammy Jo Schultz, a former U.S. Navy pilot. Southwest Airlines officials later commended, quote, her actions, calm demeanor, and competence during the emergency, end quote. U.S. Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chao had praised for, quote, the pilots who safely landed the aircraft and the crew and fellow passengers who provided support and care for the injured, preventing what could have been far worse, end quote. The media called Captain Schultz a hero with nerves of steel. It was not the first time that Tammy Jo Schultz had faced and overcome a challenge. As one of the first women to fly fighter jets for the Navy, she had overcome barriers, setbacks, and people who doubted her. As a high school senior, Tammy Jo Bonneau asked about a career in flying and was told that there were no professional women pilots. While in college, she applied to the Air Force but was turned down. During graduate school, she applied to the Navy she was dismissed as a girl pilot that the Navy didn't need. But she was determined to try one more time, and she was finally accepted into the Navy's flight school, where she earned her wings in the T-34 Mentor. Tammy Jo served as a flight instructor in the T-2 Buckeye and qualified in the A-7 Corsair II. When her squadron transitioned from the Prowler to the F-A-18 Hornets, Tammy Jo became one of the first women in the Navy to qualify in that frontline combat aircraft. The F-A-18 Hornet was designed for both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground combat. Its avionics, cockpit displays, and flight characteristics make it a very versatile aircraft. It can operate from an aircraft carrier and can carry a wide variety of weapons. Operated by the U.S. Navy and Marines and by several foreign allies, the F-A-18 was also flown by the Navy's Blue Angels Flight Demonstration Team. At the time of Desert Storm, U.S. military policy prevented women from flying in combat, so Tammy Jo flew as an instructor-aggressor pilot, training other naval aviators. Following her active duty, Tammy Jo was promoted to Lieutenant Commander and assigned to the Navy Reserves where she flew FA-18s. She retired from the Navy with Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medals, a National Defense Service Medal, and a Marksmanship Medal. She married Dean Schultz, a fellow naval aviator, and the two of them joined Southwest Airlines as pilots. On the day the 737's engine exploded, Tammy Jo hadn't expected to be in the cockpit. She had traded schedules with her husband for that flight. After retiring from Southwest Airlines, Tammy Jo wrote about her experiences and the challenges and accomplishments of her flying career. Her book is called Nerves of Steel, How I Followed My Dreams, Earned My Wings, and Faced My Greatest Challenge. It is less about her heroism on Flight 1380 and more about the experiences that forged the competence and cool head that made her a hero to 148 passengers and crew. Today, women occupy a growing number of seats in the cockpits of commercial airliners and U.S. military aircraft. Many of them were inspired by women like Tammy Jo Schultz, pioneers who were told that girls don't become pilots, but who followed their dreams, overcame the challenges, and earned their wings.
please. Take your seat. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ed McElhenney. Um, if you were here last year, you might remember my face. I'm a year older. I've got hearing aids now, and I just replaced my right knee. So I probably won't be standing the entire show today. But uh, it's not my show. It's this lady's show over here. Um, you just saw the introduction. I'm honored to be here, uh, to be the rudder that steers the ship, so to speak. Um, and I could introduce her as, what, Lieutenant Commander Schultz. I could introduce her as Captain Schultz. But instead, I introduce her as my friend, Tammy Jo. And Tammy Jo, thank you so much for being here. And uh, the airplanes that are here, by the way, um, one is obviously the F-18. This is a Growler, F-18G. And I'm going to say my thank yous right up front. These folks that are sitting here in these green suits, um, they came from Whidbey Island, Washington. And uh, they... It's their airplane, so thank you, uh, guys and girls, um, for providing that airplane. And the next two people over there, Tim and Claire Knutson, um, that's their N3N. And no, Tammy Jo didn't start her Navy career in the N3N. No, she didn't. Um, but it's their airplane, um, and that young lady there uh, with a microphone in her hand, she's the one who flew it in here, 21 years old, and she's been flying it for three years. And... Uh, and what it does is get it back to where we really want to talk about uh, women in aviation, first of all. Um, the reason we're here today, and I'll just tell you right now, that uh, Connie and I were watching the Super Bowl this year. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you watched the Super Bowl. And did you see the flyby? You know, we always enjoy the Star Spangled Banner and then the flyby afterwards. Anybody remember what was in the flyby? Oh, yeah, okay. F-35 was, was flight lead. You had two Super Hornets on the wing, and you had a Growler in trail, okay? I said, hey, that's pretty cool. Okay, they don't show it very long. But then they had some cockpit views. And in the cockpit views, all of a sudden I'm going, wow, that's a girl, and that's a girl, and that's a girl, and that's a girl. They were all females flying these fighters. And I'm, you know, yeah, and I'm, well... I, I was at first taken aback. I'm going, come on, you know, we fly these things too. Why not at least have one guy in there? But then they brought up the fact that, hey, the reason they were doing that was because it was the 50th year that female aviators were allowed to fly Navy airplanes. So it was the 50th anniversary. And I sat there and I said, that's good. I get it. Wonderful. And then Connie and I looked at each other and said, okay, do we know any female Navy aviators. And <laughs> we said, yes, we do. And so a couple phone calls, and the next thing you know, Tammy Jo says, yes, indeed. Uh, I would be pleased and happy to uh, be part of this program. So that's how we got to where we are. So it's going to be concentrated more on uh, female Navy aviators. And, uh, and I'll just say right now, first of all, uh, and I do this on every presentation, uh, military veterans, active, uh, retired, Please stand. We want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you for your service. Um, and the follow-on to that, of course, is how about female aviators? How many female aviators do we have in the audience out there today? Can we see those who... S please stand if you're a, naval, a, a, a female aviator, okay? <laughs> We've got a few. You are in. The, uh, yes, you are. You are. You got to be kidding me. You're in the back seat of that thing. So. <laughs> so anyway, that's why we're here today. And Tammy Joe can help me out a little bit on this because, hey, you know, uh, ladies flew these airplanes way back when the Wasps uh, back in the '40s. And uh, yeah, feel free to chime in any time. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn a little bit over to Tammy Joe right now. Right. One of the things that I've heard this year, because it's the 50th year of uh, celebrating 50 years of women flying in the military, the Navy was first. Sorry. Yeah, you're I right. I, I, I agree. Um, it's the Air Force versus Navy today. But um, uh, often I hear, well, but the WASPs were first. And truly, we do stand on the shoulders of the WASP if you're a female aviator in the military because they flew military aircraft. 
However, they were not in the military. They bought their own uniforms. They designed, and Jacqueline Cochran made their wings. They paid board and room. <laughs> they had no medical. Uh, if somebody was uh, killed in the line of duty, which did happen, uh, the girls pitched together to pay for uh, either transportation of the body home or the funeral. Uh, so the military itself, those ladies wore wings of silver, and in the Navy in 1973, they opened it up for women to fly, and the wings were gold, were open to women. And the, the missions truly back then, I mean, they did ferry missions, they did test missions, they, did, they, they got shot at, they, uh, they, did, uh, they, they towed banners, you know, and if you don't know, you know, they would tow a banner for a gunnery practice and stuff like that. High altitude stuff, they did a lot of dangerous stuff, yet, yet they, again, still... Hey, couldn't be in the military, and that was the way it was. Right, and, and it's interesting to me because not only did they, they fly, which I think we owe them a, a solemn uh, but happy moment of gratitude for that, but so many of them went on to do things like Betty Green, who you don't hear very often about the uh, wasp named Betty Green, but if you're familiar with Mission Aviation Fellowship, she was their first pilot. It was her vision before she even went into the WASPs to use aviation to break that isolation of people with medical education and spiritual help. So uh, that's an organization that is around the world and alive today. And whenever we talk about towing banners, one of her stories was when she towed the banner, they initially shot at her aircraft until <laughs> until her uh, male instructor uh, got on the horn and said, hey, the banner. And uh, so the mortars <laughs> quit exploding by the cockpit and near the aircraft, and they started to the banner. So it was sometimes more dangerous than necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's how it started. And then, then we got into 1973, and Tammy Jo sat there and said, hey, I want to do this. And yeah... Unfortunately, the United States Air Force said no, and uh, yeah, there's more to that story, I'm sure, also. Right. Well, and, and to begin with the ladies who started in 1973, there were some, uh, three of the ladies were already in OCS, going through officer candidate school, so they said, well, let's take, see if any of those ladies are interested. So uh, Judy, Jane, and Barbara, began, uh, they finished their OCS, and then three other ladies, Mary, Rosemary Mariner, who was my skipper in the Navy, and Joellen. Mm -hmm. So the first three, they gave props, and the last three, they gave helos, but Rosemary uh, dug in her heels and said, nope, I came with my commercial and my college at 19, I want jets. <laughs> and so that was the, the original six. Wow. And, and Rosemary ended up being a former a commander of yours, correct? Right. She was the first woman to take command of an aviation squadron in the U.S. Okay. And uh, VAQ-34, it was, it was commissioned during Reagan's time as president. And so he was increasing the Navy not only by ships but by aircraft. And so our, our mission was to study Russian, Chinese, and French weapons and tactics and then employ those against the fleet. And it ran from Top Gun students, other squadrons, single ships, to uh, entire carrier group or workups. Okay, and just to show that <coughs> I've done my homework, uh, VAQ, y you know, you'll hear her talk about VAQ, and that's what these folks are out of too. They're out of a VAQ squadron. The V stands for fixed wing, okay? Right. The A stands for attack, okay? And the Q stands for electronic, okay? So they're jammers, basically. That's what, th what this airplane is designed to do, and that's what that squadron was designed to do. Um, it was a support squadron, if you will, but that was the VAQ that and you were a member of that, uh, that squadron also. Right, and, and to be honest, I don't know all of the Growler um, mission, but we did more than jam. Mm -hmm. We simulated, and so I think maybe do you all do simulations as well? Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah. that, that mission is still alive today. It just uh, transferred from that mm -hmm. small VAQ-33 and 34 uh, sister squadrons to the Growler community today. All right. How about a quick uh, synopsis of your career? Okay. You obviously started out in uh, the T-34 and then worked your way up. Right. Um, 
and actually, I mean, just as a real quick review, for those that might be uh, listening or younger ears that think, I don't, I don't know how to get into a cockpit. And I saw the jets overhead, our, our ranch there in southern New Mexico. And I was one of them, by the way. I was a, a T-38. That was fighter lead-in training at Holloman, New Mexico. And believe right. it or not, that time frame, that right. was probably, I was probably up there. Right. And uh, I'll be sending you the bill for all the broken windows <laughs> later. Because it wasn't until I was in the, in the Navy later and, and had done some air-to-air -air that I realized there really was no reason for those guys to go scorching by our ranch breaking the sound barrier and all our windows at 500 feet or so. It There's not a lot of air to air that happens it was at fun. that altitude. It was fun. Come yeah. on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we know what kind of a rule breaker you are. <laughs> but uh, so seeing this, this air show overhead as they anchored their dogfighting practice over our hay barn, uh, I mentioned to my folks, you know what? I think that's what I'd like to do. And uh, my mom came back with, Tammy, though, those people are smart. <laughs> she always had a wonderful frank way about her. It still does. And um, so I started reading books about airplanes and, and pilots and saw, read the book Jungle Pilot. Uh, Nate Saint was the pilot in that, an MAF pilot. And he'd gotten his start in the military for No Money Down, which was the amount I had. And so that kind of just opened the doors for me, and I could see this faint footpath emerging from cock or from barnyard to cockpit. And so that's the path I followed. And um, everybody shut their doors. At that time, it was 1983 by the time I got my college degree. And the Air Force said no three times and don't come back. And then the Army was polite, listened, and said, you are not a fit for us. So I moved on to the Navy. And truthfully, it's, it is a good lesson. And sometimes those doors that are shut are meant to be shut because the Navy was the only branch at that time that was allowing women to fly tactical aircraft in tactical missions, and the combat exclusion policy was solidly in place. It wasn't even being considered to be lifted, but the Navy had the attitude that if it's not combat, go for it. And so that's why I got to fly A7s and then Rosemary Mariner, who was in the first class, and our skipper, when they started considering lifting the combat exclusion policy. Uh, sent us to A7 weapons, two of us. But I started in the T-34, back to your question, I didn't forget. The T-34 and then on to the, uh, and I do have to stop and just say I arrived without hardly knowing what an aileron was. So on the first flight, my skipper, not my skipper, my instructor who was a Marine, um, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> United, <laughs> United States Marine Corps, I should say. Then he, he said, I'm going to demo most of this. Just pay close attention. So I did. He did the departure, showed me how to maneuver within the MOA via beaches, buildings, things like that. And then he said, let's go do some touch and goes at the outlying field. I'm just going to, let's just do a downwind entry. And my, it was my first real helmet fire because I thought, I have no idea what he's talking about. A downwind entry. I'd studied the break. I knew the break, but... But he was demoing, so I thought, well, I'll just write down what he does. And he rolled inverted, pulled down, rolled upright on altitude, airspeed, and the downwind. So I just drew what I thought it looked like and learned how to land and went back, did the break. The next day I said, all right, Bono, show me that you listened. And so we did all the things that we did the day before. And he said, all right, let's go do some touch and goes. So I, we're about the same place we were the day before, and I got as close as I could. I rolled inverted, pulled down. There was, well, I know Marines don't scream, but <laughs> he was using his excited voice. <laughs> and the beating of fists on the canopy <laughs> let me know that he wasn't as buckled in for my downwind entry as I had been for his. So it was a debrief item, and, and I learned what the downwind entry was. But on to T2s. I recovered from that. By the way, the T2, if, if you look over <laughs> our shoulder here to the left, there's a T2 Buckeye right there. That's what she's about to talk about. Right. That uh, it has the, the, um, uh, 
the name uh, the guppy by those who who fly it just because it looks like that fierce little fish. But it is a sturdy a sturdy jet, you know, straight wing, tip tank, so it's very, very stable. But uh, it was our first jet to bring aboard the boat. Uh, this was pre-Top Gun 1, so we didn't have all the film footage of the carrier deck or the Kenny Loggins music to inspire us as we went out. And we're trying to sneak a peek at the... At the uh, at the carrier at the Lexington as we're in four plane formation threatened with death if we made the airplane you know the formation <laughs> look bad so that was that was uh, certainly fun they they send you out there and I'm sure it's probably the same but every stage of flight that we had learned so far we always had an instructor and then you go to the, do your carrier landings you practice on the field but the first time you go see the boat you're solo and every time as a student, the, they told us they couldn't pay anybody enough to get in their <laughs> back seat. But they had figured out that they need your, your decision loop very tight around the carrier. It's a dynamic area. They don't need you thinking about what your instructor is thinking about what you should do. They just need you thinking about what you should do. And um, my first launch, they had told us, okay, don't show us the plan form of your T2, you know rise slowly and don't stall out and so especially being the only girl in my squadron it, which happened the first four squadrons I was the only uh, female there so I was determined they weren't I was not gonna look like a sissy so as I got shot off I just kept going <laughs> 60 feet above the water finally they said Von L pull up <laughs> and, um, and when I got back my instructor had written in the book check intake for mackerel <laughs> so on to the A4 and uh, it was we don't have an A4 here but I bet there's one on the lines in place it's anybody who's flown the A4 loves it it was light attack uh, pulled back from the fleet for training and so we traded in the stable wings and tip tanks for the very delta wings and the maneuverability to do all the fleet exercises that we would plan to see in the future. Low levels, bombing, strafing, air to air, and more carrier. Oh, and then A7, I talked a little bit about that. But and but before, A7 was operational. I mean, that was when okay, you went VA. Right. But but before that, didn't you do the the, uh, I, the, the T2 as a, we I used to call them FAPES, so as a surgrad, was that right. what you were? In okay. the, I have to say, the Navy, made it a good deal. I, I don't know that the Air Force still has come around to that. But the Navy being a SIR grad, uh, you, you, whenever you got your wings, then you had to have a good grade average and the skipper has to um, ask for you. And so uh, I had a great skipper, Commander Grant, in T2s and I went back to instruct for him. He was even more fun to instruct for than to be a student in his squadron. And I instructed in T2s. Uh, had a change of command. Those but before you go there, uh, yeah. yeah, you instructed in the T2. Isn't, isn't one of your students in the T2 here too? I don't know. Okay. Oh, uh, oh yes, I suppose he is. is, is right uh, there. Dean, where's, where's Dean? <laughs> De oh, oh, yeah, by the way, that's, that's Dean. That's Tammy <laughs> Joe's husband. And, and De I found this out today that Dean was one of Tammy Joe's students in the uh, yes. T2 Buckeyes. I'm so. not going to leave it there, Ed. I have to tell you. <laughs> I wasn't his instructor, and he called saying he couldn't find a cross-country instructor, and he needed one. So I, you know, I said, well, do you, you felt have sorry him? for him. Right. There were three other, uh, there was a total of four airplanes going. The night before, everybody else canceled. <laughs> and I've always been suspicious of that. Well, but Well done, um, Dean. Well done. That's all I can say. <laughs> And he was charming, but I thought, you know what? I'm grading him. He needs to be charming. <laughs> but he has All been right. charming for the last 35 years. All right. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> you can continue your story now. But, yeah, Dean Schultz is uh, – go ahead. D Dean, stand up. Wave everybody. That's <laughs> another Southwest guy, another Hornet guy. Uh, yep, another veteran. So thanks for being here. So I did instruct for a couple of years. I had a change of command in the middle of that. I had gotten my – advanced quals as an instructor, teaching carrier landings, and then I had just finishing up my uh, guns qual, and the new skipper said, oh no, I will not have a woman teaching weapons in my squadron. So I got pulled from that and sent to teach out of control flight. And in the T2, this is in the T2 In the now. T2, yes. 
And while it was not my choice, uh, and rather punitively assigned. It turned out to be some of the best training that I ever had. Uh, it's true, you don't know a subject till you teach it. And um, we had more than spins. One day you had asked me about, uh, one day we had a asymmetrical transfer of fuel in our tip tank and they were old enough at the time that the, the um, float valve that you can see, the plexiglass was so, uh, clouded, we really couldn't see the ball very well. So in flight, we didn't realize that when we did our first stall, we had one empty tip tank and one full. So that made for not a spin, but a spiral. And at that time, the T2 Buckeye didn't have spiral recovery technique in the NATOPS. They'd done it at test pilot school by just seeing how can we make this thing spiral. But we didn't have any procedures to get out. And so my student, it was supposed to be just a stall, and then it whips around. And if you're not familiar, a spin is kind of a maple leaf going around sideways, uh, flat at about 90 knots, oscillating. But a spiral is a drill bit, and it gets faster and faster. And the student, I took the controls. Usually I waited till 18,000 feet, starting at 30. But this one I just took immediately. And he uh, started with 28, 27, 26, 27, and by the time we were at 10, it was just a squeak. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but we did, I was getting married in just a couple of months, and I remember thinking, you know, adrenaline gives you that slowdown of, of time just because it accelerates your thought process. And I just remember thinking, I will be a Godzilla bride. This is going to be <laughs> awful. Because ejecting is kind of a messy, bruisey situation. And um, so I tried all the different combinations I could think of. And at 5,000 feet, we wobbled into control and pulled out. And wow. I was afraid he wouldn't go back and do the flight again, the student, because it was not an enjoyable ride. So we went up and finished the flight. <laughs> and... Uh, he kissed the ground when we got back, unashamedly. Wow. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I've been out of control uh, several times. Our out of control altitude was 10,000 feet. If you're out of control passing 10,000 feet, you're out of there. And, uh, and the fact that you stayed with it as long as you did, yeah, and, and figured out how to, hey, make that thing recover. And I guess it was after the fact, you know, when you said, hey, the airplane did this, we don't know why, and that's when they figured out, oh, by the way, you know, there was right. a, a, a transfer problem, and yeah, that's what made it do what it did. Right. It was kind of funny to me. It was kind of funny in that we went back and said, we had a spiral, and um, the skipper said, no, you didn't, and I said, no, we really, and we described it, and he turns to my student, he goes, did you really have a spiral? And so we called TPS and found out, you know, what were the procedures to get out of it, which I memorized. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. How about transitioning to the F-18? Was that uh, a, a pretty big transition? You know, it, it, it was interesting because I think Rosemary, uh, Captain Mariner, sending Pam Lyons and I ahead to do the A-7 weapons training with the fleet-bound pilots before the combat exclusion policy was lifted, you know, operating an aircraft in its dy most dynamic performance arena really helps prepare you for anything. It broadens your aviation base. So going to the Hornet was a big jump uh, in responsiveness uh, as well as mission because A7's, um, you know, a face only a mother could love. But great low-level aircraft, uh, great attack. It had more, carried more Mike Mike than the Hornet and... Uh, things like that, but the the responsiveness and being able to do more air-to-air -air came along with going to the Hornet. And um, Pam and I were the first to go through the RAG. It hadn't been open to women before, and there were some really great attitudes to meet us, and there were some really not great attitudes to meet sure. us. And uh, it's, it's really always made me come away from that whole idea of transparency uh, with a new perspective. I think it's a little like yoga pants, not for everybody. 
how about I got to ask the question, when, when I transitioned to the F-16, they made all of our instructors at that point go down to the spin dryer, the, uh, the centrifuge. Right. Was that a requirement for you guys and sure. girls, you know, when, when you went through the uh, F-18 school? Sure. Okay. Um, yes, and we've hopefully taken any of those images out of the public <laughs> domain. <laughs> I know. It, it's not pretty. It's I've, not pretty. I, I, I've got one, too. But we did have some people who, who really struggled, um, and i got to say, from a personal standpoint, we put the first female F-16 pilot um, through our guard school in, in Wichita. Jackie Parker was her name, um, and, uh, and she wasn't a big girl. But she had she had a few issues with G-loadings, you know. I mean, uh, she wasn't the best, she wasn't the worst, but she she learned to cope, you know. I mean, we all had G-suits and stuff like that. But you know, for for our our F-16, it was a 9G airplane. The the Hornets, what a 7.3? I, I can't remember. Uh, I think 7.8. Okay, 7.8. Okay, uh, but still, that's a lot of G's, you know. And, uh, and and yeah, and she like I said, you know, she graduated and did fine. But uh, but I was just wondering, you know, in air to air combat, was ever a factor for you? You know, it it wasn't, but it's kind of to me. I think it's a little like air sickness. Some people have a tendency for it. Some people don't. Some people have an affinity for for uh, withstanding G's. Some don't. I I don't think it's a male female issue. I think it's person to person. I. I, we did find that, like after a break, after we'd gone on leave or Christmas, and we get in, we we wouldn't go right to seven again. Yep. You know, you give yourself a flight or two to to get, I'd say, G buffed up for it, and then you're on. I was the same way. You know, I was flying for the airlines at the time, and if I had a uh, international flight, you know, and it was a three-day trip, hey, that next day after I got home, I wouldn't fly a high G flight. I mean, yeah, it was it was right. like, hey, at least take a day off, and uh, and yeah. All right, um, so uh, we've gone from the T-34 to the T-2 to the A-7 to the F-18, and now i got to say, since we're getting close on time, uh, let's, let's go to the Southwest thing. Got hired by Southwest, and, uh, right. and away you went. Um, easy, hard, did they accept you right away? Of course we've got, where's Connie back there? Yeah, if you didn't know, Connie, uh, let's see, third female hired by Delta Airlines in 1978. Um, it was probably a little easier for you, but was there difficulty in getting hired as a female by Southwest? You know, I don't know that the difficulty was really in getting hired. It was um, surviving sometimes. Okay. <laughs> but I have to mention the good guys because there were always good guys. I feel like God always provided people like Jerry Bradley, who's in the, in the crew here, and Jim Rice, um, who are, I believe is here as well. And... So I always had some incredible men as mentors and leaders, and it was it was a turbulent time. I would say just because we all nobody deals with change well. Uh, we all have something about the way things used to be that we liked. So there was a big change. Aviation is a tight community. Women going into combat didn't set well, even in a commercial cockpit, and so, with some folks. Even though I don't rule Congress, I had nothing to do with it. You know, that was something I heard a lot about. Then there was um, crew resource management that had come on the scene, and that meant we were going to utilize both co both pilots in the cockpit. There was no more sky gods. Captains now had a Magna Carta. They had to, you know, be a, a team player. And so there were some that had grown up in the idea of, I am finally a sky god and I'm holding on to it. That it was, it was a little difficult, but those things... You know, time marches on, and um, I think everybody learned. How about uh, becoming a captain? How long were you a first officer before you turned into a captain? I was a first officer for five years. I had our second baby, took some ti extra time off with the marshal, and then uh, went back and was a captain for 20. Okay. Okay. And i got to bring up the fact that uh, Marshall is their son. Uh, he can't be here today. Uh, you knew this was coming, okay? You you started it with the Air Force Navy thing. So it's anyway, fine. their son graduated from the United States Air Force Academy um, uh, last year, okay? Uh, I, 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 I we we asked him. Dean and I are both Navy pilots. We said, Marshall, is this how a good son rebels? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm bringing honor back to the family name. <laughs> Uh, and, oh, by the way, one of the growler uh, girls over there is a United States Naval Academy graduate, by the way. Thank so, you. So she's <laughs> nice to be represented. Um, and, and, yeah, Marshall's right now in what, T6 school, flying formation? T6, T6 learning to fly close and, and to other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
All right, so now we're into the southwest side of things a little bit, and uh, boy, I don't want to go through the whole story, and, and I will just compliment you on your actions, your crew's actions, I should say, because as well we know, um, it's not just Tammy Joe that did it. It's Tammy Joe. It's the first officer. It's the flight attendants in the back who uh, who helped out and 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 yeah, launched out of LaGuardia, headed to uh, Dallas, as I remember, and uh, you know all of a sudden, you know, bang. Um, and I can sit there, you know, as a former airline guy. I don't know how many times I was in simulator training. You know, the instructor goes boom. You know, he hits the side of the the, the simulator. You know, an engine rolls back. Hey, you hear a hissing sound. You know, hey, O2 mask got. You know, and you do the, the what do they call it? Immediate action items and all that kind of stuff. But that's what she was trained to do, and she did it extremely, extremely well. And I compliment you on that. And uh, and yeah, I'll I'll turn it over and just say hey things that you, you want to bring out to the crowd that you think uh, is important? Sure. Well, as Ed said, aviation, no matter how many seats in the airplane, is never a solo sport. And I had incredible crew. Darren Elliser was my first officer. My flight attendants were Kathy, um, I'm sorry, Rachel Fernheimer, Catherine Sandoval, and Shanique Mallory. And I say their names slowly because it's important. They were a huge part of the success of that day. And uh, we were headed from Philly to, uh, excuse me, from New York to Dallas, full of passengers, even one on the jump seat, and then heavy with fuel, about 33,000 feet. We heard that bang, but instead of the bang and the engine rolling back, we heard the bang, the engine rolled back, did a snap roll pitch over, and skidded. And uh, so the bang turned into a shudder and a roar rather than calming down, and we got control of the aircraft and, and uh, tried to slow down some of the shuddering uh, by just slowing the, the aircraft down. The shuddering that, in, that came on was enough that we couldn't focus our eyes on instruments or checklists, and then there was uh, smoke that had been pulled into the cockpit from the explosion, and then a condensation cloud from the rapid depressurization, since we were uh, close to 33,000 feet. And the shuddering, we found out later, came from from the the damage, the Ooh. engine, whenever the number 13 blade had severed near the hub and the dovetail, it had helixed forward and had a, and created a sonic boom inside of the engine, which that's actually what did the damage, not the blade itself. Mm. But that, so that kind of peeled the engine cowling back like a banana peel and the small pieces tore chunks out of the leading edge of the wing and, and uh, different parts of the fuselage and the tail. Uh, one rather large chunk, one of the buckles from underneath the cowling struck right in front of the 14th row window. And so that's what took out that window. And the, the shuddering from all the damage, which never really got into a syncopation. I mean, there was always a different feel and tear and sound, which I think was, was really disconcerting for those in the back as well. Uh, who were closer to the sound, I think. And then the rapid depressurization. I know it's a, it's a mouthful, but everybody has seen one. If you see a balloon pop, you've seen a rapid depressurization, and it's air equalizing pressure, and it does so rapidly and with force. We were at 33,000 uh, feet equalizing our cabin pressure, which was at 7,000 at that point, 70 degrees inside the cabin, negative 25 outside. And then the roar that came along that never went away, that grew, and it, it just got to a certain decimal, and it just stopped because there was no more available. And it smothered every sound in a way that Darren and I, we only sit a foot and a half apart, but we couldn't even hear our own voice over it. And uh, so that of course, is caused by all the wind coming in that one window. When you go down the road at 60 miles an hour, you know uh, how disconcerting that one window down can be, not just from the sound, but also from the reverberation of 60 mile an hour wind trying to get out of that window that it's also coming in. And we were 550 uh, miles an hour plus whenever this happened. So there was just a lot of dynamic uh, air temperature, pressure, things going on. And Darren and I uh, 
I think we both kind of had a, a moment of isolated uh, adrenaline filled time there when you can't really see anything or communicate and you have a uh, stabbing pain in your ears as your station tubes collapse and then realizing you're not breathing very well. And uh, after we got it back in, we got our oxygen masks on. We did it one at a time because at that point we needed both feet, both hands and full attention. I was going to say, that, you know, the first rule in aviation is maintain aircraft control. You know, maintain and, aircraft control. And, and that's what they did very well. And then uh, analyze the problem, take appropriate action, and then maintain situational awareness. So we kept control of the aircraft. The first problem was we needed oxygen. <laughs> we weren't, so we mm -hmm. took care of that one at a time and then uh, figured out where we, where we needed to go. Long runway, medical, within a uh, decent distance, which was Philadelphia. And, um, and I like your radio calls too. I mean, it's just like calm as you could possibly be. <laughs> I'm just going, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I think my voice would go up real high. But no, she'd say, hey, you know, mayday, mayday, mayday. Hey, you know, we got an engine. I think the words used were we have an engine fire and then you said you were losing some parts I think and uh, uh, it was oh, it well it was probably the fourth time that they asked me if I was declaring an emergency that I said yes we have parts missing and <laughs> someone went out uh, because at that point we uh, we didn't know all that had happened we yeah. did know that there was a window out and that um, that we needed to slow down yeah. for the the yeah. Uh, gentlemen who are helping, and I have to take a moment anytime I speak about Flight 1380, I do want to highlight some passengers that got up and truly, along with the flight attendants, changed the ending of the day for those people. And that is Tim McGinty, Andrew Needham, and 78-year-old Peggy Phillips, wow. who got up during this flight that uh, was very rough and did CPR on Jennifer Reardon, our passenger that we were not able to return uh, to her, to her family. Wow. Well, I, again, in, in the name of time, I've, I've, I've got to compliment you on, on uh, hey, yes, you had good training. Uh, you, you, you did exactly what you were trained to do. And I, I, I say that for the airline pilots that are out there. You know, again, you know, that's, that's what they, that's, that's our job. You know, our job is to handle situations just like that. And y you made it look, you know, I, I won't say routine, but hey, you did all the right things at the right time. Um, fortunately, there was, or unfortunately, th there was one passenger lost. But, uh, but it could have been, you know, so much worse. And, uh, and, and yeah, so, uh, so well done. Um, and, uh, yeah, and uh, hopefully, the, you know, the, there will never be another situation like that again. And if so, I hope somebody like you is in the cockpit to do it. So I, I well, compliment you. Thank you. All right. Um, <coughs> we're going to go over. I can tell that already. But um, we're going to do a quick walk around of the aircraft. I'm going to start first with the N3N, and Claire is going to come up over here and talk a little bit. This is the 21-year-old who's, let's see, uh, yeah, flew it in here. She's been flying it for three years. Um, her dad is uh, the owner of the airplane over there, too. Um, and I, I'm I'm hoping that she may turn into a form, uh, a future uh, Air Force aviator, but uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll f or Navy, it's okay. But, uh, we have to but talk yeah, we'll clear. see. But uh, experienced <laughs> pilot, um, started flying in J3s, and go ahead. And where'd you go from there? J3s, and then? Yeah, absolutely. So I started in a J3 Cub uh, when I was probably 13. I remember my first flight lesson with my dad. We have a airstrip uh, in northern Wisconsin, a grass strip, 2,000 feet, and so. I remember the first day I was taxiing and 13 years old, I didn't really know how to move my feet quite correctly and I thought I was going to go in the hay field and he said, no, just keep going, you're not going to go in. So that was my first memory of taxiing the J3 Club and of course, you know, now taxiing this thing is a beast, but that definitely prepared me. So yeah, I started at 13 probably, I mean not officially, but, and then at 15, um, I decided to take a little break. My brother passed away in an aircraft accident, and so I just wasn't quite into the aviation at that point, but maybe around 16 or 17, I just knew that he absolutely loved aviation, and I wanted to continue that passion in my family um, and be the next generation of pilot. So at 17, uh, on the morning of my junior prom, I soloed uh, our family 150, and 
Then about a year later in 2020, um, COVID hit, school shut down, but of course, aviation didn't shut down. You know, flying a 150 around alone in the air was the perfect way to spend COVID. So 2020, I got my private pilot's license, then I went off to UW-Madison, and then uh, on winter breaks, I would normally uh, work on my writtens, and then in the summer, I did my instrument rating. The following summer, I did my commercial rating, and then this past uh, January, I got my uh, commercial multi-engine rating, and now here we are. And so I guess when I was 19, I was able to take the N3N around the patch for the first time alone, and that was super exciting. And now I've just kind of in the summers when I'm home, I absolutely loved to fly it with my dad, and flying it in this year was incredible, and the Fisk arrival, and landing it right on the green dot was just something that I've dreamed of my entire <laughs> life. So it was great to be able to experience that, and now being here surrounded by, you know, these w amazing women in aviation is just a great experience. So I'm so happy to be here, and thank you so much for having us and the N3N on display. The, you know, the How about the history? How long have you had the N3N? So I believe my dad and his sister, Heidi, uh, went to pick it up in, in Florida when he was maybe 21 and she was 16, and they flew it from Florida to Wisconsin in 1990. So we've had it in the family for a little over probably 30 years. Wow. So yeah, I've grown up with it, and I've never really truly understood the history until we've kind of been preparing for this, and you know, knowing all the different naval aviators that had trained in this, and it was on floats, the Naval Academy is just, you know, incredible to be able to fly this piece of history, and if only an airplane could talk, that's, that'd be incredible to hear the stories that it's how about, how about some differences? You know, everybody looks at it and says, oh, it looks like a Stearman. Right, and exactly. So I think some of the main differences are that it has four ailerons, and then um, it's also a little bit heavier than a Stearman, and then the landing gear is uh, completely different. I think the rudder also is different, and then I think the main part is that it's all aluminum, and so I believe that uh, Stearman have some, like, piping and so that there can lead to some corrosion in there that you just wouldn't know about. So the nice thing about the N3N is that you can see everything and so if there's any corrosion or anything happening with that, you can, you know, be sure to tackle that right away and there's no 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 surprises for you. I think those are the main ones. Oh, we also have removable wingtips. So it was a World War II trainer, so I think a lot of the cadets would ground loop it, and so they could just run out, switch the wingtips, and keep on moving. <laughs> so, yeah. But you've never done that. Nope. Not <laughs> don't plan on it either. Uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for allowing us to have the beautiful airplane here. Uh, congratulations on flying it in, too. Yeah. Good luck flying it out. Um, <laughs> it, that's, that's always you. exciting also. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm going to stop there again. I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to talk to the Growler guys yeah, here absolutely. for, uh, and girls, excuse me, for a minute and just say, Yep. All right. Shelby. Yes. Hello. United States Naval Academy 2014. Okay. Um, oh. The red one. Sounds good. And Whidbey Island, and I'll stop there and just give us a little uh, history of the airplane and uh, how long you've been there, et cetera. We're going to get Tammy Joe to come up, and maybe the two of you could, like, maybe just walk around and tell some differences. This is a a super hornet that's been modified to be a growler. If you all didn't know, you know, a growler, it basically replaced the EA-6B, correct? Yes, okay. that's correct. Yeah. EA-6B was a, ja uh, was a jammer. Um, I flew with them many times. Um, standoff jammer, in close, uh, whatever you want to do. The problem with the EA-6B was it was big, it was slow. Hey, they couldn't go in with you. Well, guess what? These folks can go in with you, and y you desperately need them if you're going in today's war. Uh, with all the, uh, the electronics that are out there, hey, you want these guys. The beeps and squeaks is what we were talking about. So, uh, so yeah, go ahead and tell us a little bit about the airplane and where you guys are from. Uh, yes, sir, yeah. So we're from uh, Whidbey Island, Washington, where most of our growler squadrons are located. Uh, VAQ-129 is the uh, re fleet replacement squadron, so we are in charge of instructing the next generation up in this aircraft. So our main uh, focus for this aircraft is uh, detection and suppression of enemy uh, radiation uh, and enemy uh, employers. So we're mostly focusing on a uh, air-to-ground mission, and we're supporting uh, entities that need to get in close to take out those uh, targets or uh, in get into an area. We're out there 
kind of suppressing anything that would detect them or cause them harm. And you're an EWO, correct? Yes, sir. Electronic warfare officer. So she sits in the back there and got Tells all the, the stuff, okay? Yeah. The yes. guy up front does the pilot stuff, okay? And hey, she's the one who's sitting there and hey, she can tell when she gets lit up by you know, a variety of systems, and hey, c she can shut them down. I, I, and they don't have any of the pods. Typically, a, a, you know, a mission uh, with this airplane, how many pods do you have on board the airplane? Uh, yeah, we can usually uh, take up to three pods as a standard loadout, and we fly usually in a section of growlers so that we can offer suppression from different angles. Okay, yes, sir. and I'll ask Tammy Joe. Okay, difference between what you flew and, and this thing right now, Super Hornet versus the, the normal Hornet that you flew. Well, for one thing, it's bigger, yep. square intakes, and um, I don't know that the pylon is I pylons are any different. Are they different? They're slightly canted, but not, not oh, okay. so different. Yes. Okay. And uh, we we would often carry the 500, uh, 500 pound or yeah pound fuel tanks on either side with uh, then a tack or a pod. We did a lot of missile simulation. I don't know if you do yeah. that, but silkworm missiles were a big simulation yes. that we did for ships. Okay, we still do carry uh, simulated missiles and we are able to carry air to ground and air to air weaponry on board. Um, and in a full battle growler configuration, we'll usually have uh, two pods on each wing and one in the center line and then the fuel tanks uh, on the wings as well with mission, or excuse me, with our able to employ off the wing tips for air to ground and air to air. Yes, so it's a very heavy aircraft once we uh, get fully loaded up. So it's definitely a fun challenge for our pilots. Okay. I'm going to say it's 11 o'clock. They're going to start giving me the hook here right now. <laughs> I'll say thank you for thank right you now, us. but we're going to open it up to questions now. And uh, we've got... Uh, <laughs> people in the audience now, I'm going to open it up and say it's a free-for-all. So if you want to ask questions about the N3N, about the Growler, about Tammy Joe, about Claire, um, I'm sure there are some questions out there. Uh, so... Who do we got? First question. There's one in the corner over there. Uh, some of our EOs are qualified in uh, private pilots, but we are not qualified as pilots in this airframe. Okay. Tammy, what was your call sign in the military? Bonnie. <laughs> I know, it's not very exciting, but I was glad I didn't earn an exciting one. Um, <laughs> my first instructor's call sign was Clyde, and so the, the schedulers saw my maiden name, which was Bonnell, and thought, ah. So they put us on the schedule as Bonnie and Clyde and giggled <laughs> like schoolgirls every time they called us to say our jet was ready, but that's it, Bonnie. Thank you. All right, other, other questions? Okay, uh, we got some down here. Wait, she'll, she'll give you a mic. Oh, wait, oh, we have one over here. Okay, we'll get to you. Hold on a second. Go ahead, I'll, over on this side. Yeah, Tammy, during the incident, uh, you had uh, initial control um, issues. Did those continue with you to landing? So the control issues, the, the snap roll that we did to 41 degrees, um, that was brought on by the, by the explosion and, you know, that, that wing... Uh, kind of being stopping like it had a, it was a sea anchor. The other wing going so quickly, which gave it more lift, that gave us that snap roll, the pitch over. So we we certainly were able to keep control of the aircraft. Uh, we did have a little roll problems turning uh, turning left into that engine. We had to do that very carefully, or it wanted to over overbank. But um, just you know, we lost it. It severed hydraulic lines, fuel lines, things like that on that side. So there was some degradation of control, but m mainly it was just the fact that we had so much damage and those pieces of cowling that were flailing in the in the wind at the wing of the route just made it a little... It was like flying through boulders rather than that <laughs> slipstream that you're normally feeling. Okay. Next, over here. Um, I actually have a question for Claire. I'm a 17-year-old student pilot. Um, I'm about to really close to get my private. Um, how many hours did you have when you just about, like, and how, do you, how many hours do you have now? Uh, so when I got my private pilot, I probably had around, like, 
70 hours. I've got very lucky that I grew up where I grew up, and so we had airplanes. That, I had airplanes at my disposal to kind of fly whenever I wanted. Uh, right now, I have just over 300 hours. Uh, so yeah, yeah, and good luck. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Anything else for any of the people up here? Okay. Well, I will say now, if there's no other questions, we have one other presentation to make. Um, and I'll get a member of my staff. I, I see, oh, there's Connie back there. Yeah, Connie is going to help out um, on this. And afterwards, by the way, if you haven't read her book, Nerves of Steel is the name of the book. Um, she's just, just basically uh, talked about the tip of the iceberg here. Um, she's got some great stories. Um, she, she's left some of the really bad stories out. I'll say that right now. Um, and uh, thank you, ma'am. I, I appreciate that. Um, and, and she went through uh, much more than she admits to right now in, in some of her, uh, her, her, her naval career. Um, and it's, I'll be honest with you, I thought some of the, the, the stuff was inappropriate, you know, some of the things that happened to you. Um, but I also, I, I grew up in that world also. I was one of those fighter guys, and I knew some of the, 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 the guys who said, no, somebody like that doesn't deserve to do what, what we do. Um, you have obviously uh, proved them wrong. Um, I'm happy to say that. Oh, and, and we were talking about the, uh, the combat exclusion also. The combat exclusion was... Uh, uh, was in place basically the entire time that you were you were flying the United States Navy, um, and then then they lifted it. Uh, I want to say in that would have been probably '93 somewhere along in there, um, and now you know females hey they can go beyond the support role which is what you were in basically. And I found it interesting also a side light you know sh carrier qual pilot okay you know and, and an instructor in, in carrier quals you know. Yet they didn't let you land at night. Is that right? Um, in, in well, right. If you weren't ship-based, then there was no need to put you through that qual zone. Which, to me, <laughs> ju I'm just going, huh? You've got to be kidding me. You know, they, and they, they wouldn't land or let her land at, you know, at, at night on the ship. And I'm just going, huh? I, I, I didn't get that one. But now they're full up. Now they deploy full operational squadrons. They go to sea. Um, normal, normal. They're just like everybody else out there. And I think it's uh, interesting that at the, at the current time, or last week, I guess it was, uh, President Biden um, nominated the, uh, the newest uh, CNO, if you all haven't seen that. Uh, Lisa Franchetti, Admiral, uh, was just uh, nominated. She hasn't been appointed yet, but she's going to be the, the highest ranking naval officer, which I find rather interesting. Um, and she's not a flyer, you know, what can I say? But, uh, but nonetheless. Then yeah. we'll have to wait and see. Yes, yeah, yeah, we will. We'll have to wait and see. But um, what we have here, we have a, a, a volunteer who, uh, his call sign is Chaco, by the way. Yeah, yeah, well, guess why, you know? Okay. And so we, we've got some memorial chocks for you. And you can use them if you want. She flies a Malibu now, right? Okay, that's, that's, that's their, their, their airplane that they go around in. Um, and if you want to use it on the Malibu, I'm sure it'll work. But oh. it's got your name on one side of it. Um, it's got an F-18 Hornet on the other side of it. Um, he signed it on the bottom, and his, his standard um, is, uh, is, is an A-4. His name is Dave Jackson, and if you see him around here, we'll introduce you. But I, I just, you know, when I, when I turned into a commander way back when, I always, I had a commander's coin, and I always wanted people to remember, you know, who gave him that coin, just like I'd like you to remember who gave you this chalk. And so I, I just happened to have a, a little sticker that says United States Air Force on it. So... <laughs> So, 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 Sammy Joe. It will be my lucky chalk. I, I say, I say, thank you very much for what you've done. And 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 not to be outdone, Claire. We have we have a chalk for you also. Um, it is a Warbirds in Review chalk, and uh, yeah. And I say thank you to you also. I appreciate it. Um, last thing I'll say is that uh, Tammy Joe is going to be in the merchandise building right behind us here. Uh, she's got the books, uh, the book that she wrote back there. She'll be happy to, uh, to autograph them and take pictures and stuff like that. So uh, she'll be back there, I don't know, for an hour or so, somewhere along in there. But, uh, but yeah, I say thank you so much. It's been an honor.